Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about limits at infinity and limits of sequences. Up until this point, we've only considered the idea of a limit as x goes to c, where c is some fixed horizontal location. But what if instead of focusing on a single location, we considered what would happen to the function if x just kept traveling forever off to infinity? So what, if, what would we do if our x wasn't going to a single place, but we were just sort of watching it ride off into the sunset? This is the idea we'll consider in this lesson. In fact, we've actually considered this many lessons ago in the lesson on horizontal asymptotes, because a horizontal asymptote was the question of what does this function go to in the very, very long run? As x runs off to infinity, both the positive and the negative infinity, what value, what, hor what vertical value, what vi y value, what function value do we wind up running to in the long run? That was the idea of a horizontal asymptote, so we'll draw on those ideas in this lesson as well. Before we start, though, let's remind ourselves of something important. Infinity is not a location. It is not some place. You don't, like, run to the end of the rainbow and there you are at infinity. You always have to keep running. The idea of infinity is just going on forever, moving on to ever larger numbers. You never actually reach infinity. You can travel towards infinity, but you can never reach infinity. It's just the idea of going on forever. It's the idea of riding into the sunset. You don't ever actually make it to the sun, you just keep riding off into the distance, right? That's the idea of what it means to travel towards infinity. You never actually arrive there. X can't be equal to infinity, but we can consider the idea of what happens as X runs off forever and ever and ever. That's what we'll be thinking about. All right. We denote the limit of a function at infinity with, even though it says at, we're really meaning as it goes towards. Limit as x goes to negative infinity, f of x, and limit as x goes to positive infinity of f of x. And this means the value that f of x approaches as x goes off to either negative infinity or positive infinity, respectively. So negative infinity with an actual negative in sign, negative sign, that means negative infinity, and infinity just on its own with nothing there, we just assume that there's a positive side in front of it, even though we don't see it. So if you don't see a symbol, it's assumed that we're talking about positive infinity as opposed to talking about negative infinity, right? So negative infinity would go off to the left, whereas positive infinity, or just infinity with no symbol, and it goes off to the right forever. Okay. A limit at infinity works very similarly to how a normal limit works. Does the function settle down? Does it go to some specific value L? It's just, in this case, we're talking about long-term behavior instead of x going to some specific horizontal location. So instead of what happens to the function as x gets close to c, it's what happens to the function as it rides off into the sunset, what happens as it goes off to some infinity. Now, it's important to note, most of the functions, in fact, the vast majority of the functions we're used to working with, do not have limits at infinity. For example, if we consider good old f of x equals x, one of the simplest functions we're used to using, that one just keeps growing forever, so it has no limit at infinity, right? It doesn't stabilize, it doesn't settle down to some value, right? If you plug in 1 million, you get 1 million out of it. If you plug in 1 billion, you get 1 billion out of it. If you plug in 1 trillion, you get 1 trillion out of it. As you keep plugging in larger and larger numbers, it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. It's never going to stop growing, which means it's never going to settle down, which means it's never going to some specific value L. So most of the functions we're used to dealing with on a daily basis, they're actually not going to have limits at infinity because they never settle down to a specific value. They grow without bound. They might grow off to positive infinity, they might grow off to negative infinity, that is, vertically, what the output goes off to be. But they're growing without bound. They aren't going to some specific value, so that means that they won't have limits at infinity. Still, there are definitely functions that do have limits at infinity. The type of functions we will work with most often, there are some others that won't be this, but the ones that we will work with most often that have limits at infinity are rational functions. We worked with these many lessons ago when we learned about asymptotes. They're functions of the form f of x equals n of x over d of x, where n of x and d of x are polynomials and d of x is not equal to zero. So probably remember these things like this. So g of x equals 3x minus 1 over x cubed plus 4, h of x equals 1 over x to the fourth, j of x equals x to the fifth plus 47x squared over x cubed minus 15. Just some polynomial divided by some other polynomial. 
Now, because we're dividing by something, that means that our denominator, what we're dividing by, has the possibility to grow faster than the numerator. Basically, our denominator can grow fast enough to keep the numerator in check, to keep that numerator from blowing off, just like going on forever. The denominator can actually grow faster and sort of keep it tamped down. It has the ability to stabilize it to a single value in the long run, and that's why we wind up seeing rational functions give us limits at infinity so often. For a rational function, the question boils down to comparing the long-term growth rates of the numerator and the denominator. So it's a question of who is growing faster over the long term. Is it the numerator or the denominator? The numerator is growing faster than the denominator over the long term, then the thing's not really going to settle down because it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If, on the other hand, the denominator is growing faster than the numerator, then the denominator will crush the numerator, and so it will be forced to settle down. Now, we already studied this idea in horizontal asymptotes. And so let's look at those results. So if we have some rational function, f of x, and notice that that's just some polynomial divided by some polynomial, right? Some constant times x to the n, some other constant times x to the n minus 1, and working our way down to constant times x plus some constant. And same thing on the bottom as well, right? It's just constant times x to some value, constant times x to that, that value minus 1, and working our way down to a constant. So some polynomial over some polynomial. Notice from this, n is the numerator's degree, right? We got x to the n as the largest exponent on the top, and m is the denominator's degree. So m is the biggest exponent on the bottom. From this, there are three possibilities. If n is less than m, if n is less than m, then that means our top, the numerator on top, sorry, the exponent in our numerator, n, is going to be less than the exponent in our denominator, which means the denominator is going to grow faster. So it will crush the numerator, causing us to have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. If, on the other hand, n equals m, the exponent on the numerator is the leading exponent on the numerator is equal to the leading exponent on the denominator, they grow in the same category of speed. They won't necessarily have precisely the same, but one of them won't massively outclass the other one. At that point, what we'll do is we'll compare the leading coefficients, a n and b m. So the horizontal asymptote that we'd get out of that is a ratio of the leading coefficients, a n divided by bm. Because in the long run, since we've got same exponent on top and bottom, that part, the x to the sum exponent, will grow at the same rate on the top and the bottom. So it will wind up just being a question of what number are they multiplied in front. And that's why we get a horizontal asymptote based on that. And finally, the last one, if n is greater than m, that is the exponent, the leading exponent on our numerator, is greater than the leading exponent on our denominator, then that means the numerator will be able to run faster than the denominator and sort of escape the denominator's ability to bound it and hold it back, and so it will just go off forever and it won't be able to stabilize to a single value, which means it will have no horizontal asymptote. We can write this in a way where we can talk about this as limits at infinity, because since horizontal asymptotes tell us the behavior of f of x as x goes to positive or negative infinity, right? A horizontal asymptote is what value does it approach over the long term. They're also telling us the limits at infinity, since the limit at infinity is what value does it approach over the long term. So for some rational function f of x, let n be the numerator's degree and m be the denominator's degree. Let a n and b m be the leading coefficients of the numerator and the denominator, respectively. Then we have, if n is less than m, the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity of f of x equals 0. The numerator is smaller, effectively. Its uh, exponent is smaller, so its growth rate is smaller than the denominator, so the denominator crushes it down to 0. If n equals m, then the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity of f of x is equal to a n divided by b m. The growth rate on the top and the bottom is the same because they have the same leading exponent, so now it's a question of what is the ratio of the coefficients in front of them. And finally, if n is greater than m, that means the leading coefficient on top is greater than the leading coefficient on the bottom, which means the growth rate of the top is greater than the growth rate of the bottom. So their top manages to escape and sort of run off forever. So that means the limit as x goes to positive or negative infinity of f of x simply does not exist because it will never stabilize to a single value.
So that tells us what to do with rational functions. The previous method allows us to easily find limits at infinity for rational functions. But we will occasionally have to deal with other types of functions as well, right? We won't only have to deal with rational functions. So in that case, the best thing to do, there's no simple formulaic method for how to figure out here's what the limit's going to wind up being. In this case, what you want to do is you want to think in terms of how the function will be affected as x grows very large, both positive and negative. You want to think, does the function grow without bound? If it just grows forever and ever, or goes off down forever and ever, then that means that it's going to wind up not stabilizing to something in the long term, which means it won't have a limit at infinity. Or on the other hand, will it settle down? Does it go to some specific value? Does it settle down? Does it approach some specific thing over the long term? So two good ways to think about this, to figure out if this is the case, is we want to think about what happens if we plug in a large number. And by large number, I mean just sort of think like, if I were to plug in something on the scale of a million, a billion, a trillion, a really, really, really big number, right? Something large. What would happen to this? You don't have to come up with actual answers to what will happen to the thing. You don't have to produce some number in the end. You just want to think, if there was a really, really big number here, how would it affect the other things that it's near, right? Who would no longer really be important? Who would still matter? If you were to plug in a really big number, what's going to keep changing? And what will happen as that large number continues to increase? And that's one way of looking at it. The other way to look at it is to think, what are the rates of growth in the function? Which part of the function is growing faster and will continue to grow? So which parts grow faster and which parts are growing slower? That gets slower and slower as we go farther and farther out. So thinking about these two things, and that one will especially help if you're dealing with a fraction, right? How does, what's the comparison between the growth rate of our numerator versus the growth rate of our denominator? Thinking in terms of rates of growth, who is growing faster, who is growing slower, how will the rate of growth be affected as we go out to larger and larger x, these sorts of things, that and what would happen if I plugged in a very large number, thinking in terms of those two ideas will give you a good intuitive sense of what's going to happen. If you think through these questions, you can get a good idea of where the function will be going, of how the function will behave over the long term. You won't necessarily be able to come up with an absolutely precise answer, but you'll be able to get a sense of, does it make sense for this thing to have a limit at all? But sometimes you will even be able to get an exact answer by thinking through this. It depends on the situation, but just sort of try to be creative and think in a very broad, general sense. We'll also talk about ways where if you're not quite sure how to think about it, there are numerical ways that you can figure out, get a good sense of what's going on, and we'll talk about that in just a few slides. Another thing that we can talk about, using this idea of a limit at infinity, as a limit goes to infinity, we can apply it to a sequence as well. So if we have some sequence a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, blah, 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 so it is some infinite sequence that just keeps going on forever and ever and ever, then what we can consider is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n. What does our sequence go towards? What value does the sequence approach in the long run? How does this thing work out? What will it be going towards as n becomes ever larger and larger and larger. So the limit of a sequence, that's this thing right here, is very similar to the limit of a function at infinity. The question is, does the sequence settle down? Does it go to some specific value l as n runs off to infinity? So as our n becomes larger and larger and larger, does our sequence stabilize into something that's going to basically be the same as we go farther and farther and farther? Now, it's important to note, just like functions, most sequences will not have limits as n goes to infinity. For example, a really simple sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, blah, 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 it has no limit because it just grows forever. It will just grow forever because we have 1, 2, 3, 4. So if we look at a very far out term, it will be very large. But if we look at an even farther out term, it will have continued to grow and it will be even larger. So it's not going to head towards a steady value. It's not going to stabilize and go to some specific value L. It will never settle down. Nonetheless, there are definitely still some sequences out there that will wind up stabilizing, and we'll see those in the examples. But just because we're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity of a sequence doesn't necessarily mean it will stabilize. There are plenty of sequences out there that won't stabilize at all. For example, every arithmetic sequence we've ever looked at won't stabilize because it just continues stepping up and stepping up and stepping up and stepping up.
Finally, we can also talk about numerical evaluation. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell how a function or sequence will behave in the long run. In that case, we can evaluate the function numerically. That is to say, use numbers. We'll just plug in numbers and we'll see what comes out. If we have a calculator, we can use a calculator and just plug in very large numbers. And we'll want to plug in both positive and negative numbers. And then see what happens. We just see what happens to our function or our sequence, right? We plug in 10, then we plug in 100, then we plug in 1,000, then we plug in 10,000. Does it seem like it's going to a number or does it seem like it's just growing larger and larger and larger? Doing this will give us a good sense for long-term behavior. We'll be able to tell, yeah, it seems to be just growing forever and ever, or it seems to be stabilizing as we go to larger and larger numbers that we're plugging in. So this gives us a way to numerically get a sense of what's going on. It's not foolproof, but for the most part, you'll be able to figure out which one it's going to wind up going to, and you probably also have a very good estimate of what value it is going to be approaching in the long term. Similarly, if you have access to a graphing calculator or some graphing program, you can graph the function, right? If you expand the viewing window to a large horizontal region, say negative 100 to positive 100, and then you can look and see if the graph settles down in the long run. Does it seem like it's being pulled to a single value or does it seem like it's just blowing off forever and going to keep growing forever and ever and ever? Now, once again, it's not a foolproof method. There are some times where the function will fool you for the first thousand x, right? From zero to a thousand, it will look like it's growing forever and ever, but then after a thousand it will actually wind up steadying out to a single value. But for the most part, this is a pretty good way to see is this going to wind up approaching a single value or is it going to just keep growing forever and ever. So just take a look at the graph and make sure you use a large horizontal region, right? If you only look at negative 10 to positive 10 for x, you might not have a very good sense of what happens in the long run. You want to use a very large horizontal region like negative 100 to positive 100. It might be kind of hard for your graph and calculator to graph as you get to larger and larger windows, but the larger you can deal with, the better really, because that will tell you a better idea of what's going on. For the most part though, negative 100 to 100 should probably do for anything you want to graph. And then just look, does the graph settle down? Is it going to sort of tend to a single value in the long run, right? As you go to those larger x values, is it basically always graphing at the same height? And if that's the case, you know it probably has a limit. And you can figure out, looking at the graph, about what value does that wind up being. All right, we're ready for some examples. First example, evaluate the limits below if they exist. First one, limit as x goes to negative infinity of one over x. So in this case, we wanna think about what winds up happening, right? We've got that specific formulaic method, right? We have a step-by-step -step thing for analyzing what's gonna come out here. We already can see that the answer has to be zero from that formulaic method, but let's also think about what happens, right? As x goes off to negative infinity, are one divided by x, well, x continues to grow. How does the numerator grow? It doesn't grow, it's just one. It stays constant, it just sits there as one forever and ever and ever. But our x continues to get larger and larger and larger, right? We plug in 1,000, we've got, well, we plug in negative 1,000 because we're going to negative infinity. We plug in negative 1,000, we've got one over negative 1,000. We plug in negative 10,000, we've got one over negative 10,000. We plug in one billion, we've got negative one billion, we've got one over negative one billion, right? We're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's crushing down to zero, so we see that it winds up being zero. We can also tell this that that's going to wind up being the case just because our numerator has a leading exponent of zero, right? It's x to the zero would only give us one. And our bottom has x to the one, so the bottom has a higher leading exponent, so that means it's going to be crushed down to zero in the long run. Similarly, limit as x goes to positive infinity of one over x, well, our bottom is x, it does grow, but our top is one, it just stays the same forever and ever. So that means as x gets larger and larger and larger, it's going to crush our, crush our entire fraction down to zero. So we wind up getting zero for the limit here. Over here, we've got the limit as x goes to negative infinity of x cubed plus three over x squared plus x. So notice, in this case, we've got three as the leading exponent up top. So that means we've got this growth rate somewhere in the neighborhood of x cubed. But on the bottom, we've got a leading exponent of squared. So we've got a growth rate somewhere in the neighborhood of x squared. So what that means is the top in the long run will wind up growing way, way, way faster than our bottom will. So it's going to wind up outrunning the bottom effectively. We can also imagine this, if we were to plug in a very large number, then we'd have big cubed plus three over big squared plus big. Well, notice, the person who's 
the person. The number here that is the most important is big cubed, right? Big squared, that's a very large number, but big cubed is going to be even larger, right? How there's a huge difference between 10 squared and 10 cubed, right? 10 squared is 100, but 10 cubed is 1,000. So as we get out to very large numbers, big cubed is going to be massively larger than big squared. And similarly, big is just to the one, so it's practically not going to be anything compared to big squared. So in the long run, the plus three doesn't really matter. The big to the one doesn't really matter. The big squared doesn't really matter because the biggest thing of all by far is big cubed. So that means we're going to get really, really large numbers up top and nothing else is really going to be of a comparative size. So that means in the long run, it's going to blow out to infinity. In this case, it will blow out to negative infinity. So that means it's not stabilizing to a single value. So we say the limit does not exist because it's never going to stabilize because our top grows faster than our bottom will. In this case, it's going to negative infinity, so we might think of it as growing down, but in either case, it's going larger than the bottom will. Final one, limit as x goes to positive infinity of 8x to the fourth plus 3x squared divided by 2x to the fourth minus 17. So in this case, we see the important thing, leading coefficient of four on top, leading coefficient of four on the bottom. 3x squared minus 17, as we get to very large numbers, as we go farther and farther out towards infinity, 3x squared minus 17, they aren't really going to matter much in the long run as we get to very large numbers. So it really boils down to 8x to the fourth over 2x to the fourth. So in that case, we see that the x to the fourth and the x to the fourth they're going to effectively cancel each other out. So we've, all we've really got left in the long run is 8 over 2. 8 over 2 simplifies to 4, and there's our answer. We can also see this as the leading coefficients, 8 and 2. Since we've got the same leading exponents, we just do the leading coefficient on the top divided by the leading coefficient on the bottom, 8 over 2, and that's equal to 4. Great. Next example, let's look at the limits here. So these are limits of sequences, right? Since it's n going to infinity, evaluate the limits below if they exist. So the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n squared. Once again, we see, hey, this is n squared up top. It's just one, it's constant. So our bottom continues to grow and grow and grow and grow, but our top, it stays the same. So as we divide by larger and larger and larger number, it crushes it down to zero, just like the reasoning we used previously. Limit as n goes to infinity of 5n minus 1 over n plus 4. Well, in this say case, we've got 5n and n over here. So the minus 1 and the 4, they don't change as n goes larger and larger and larger. So in the long run, we've got big numbers for n, minus 1 and 4, they're kind of basically have no effect on what's going on. So we can think of them as not really mattering, which leaves us with 5n over n in the long run. So we're just comparing what are the various, what are the two leading coefficients? Five over one equals five. And there is the long, the limit as n goes out to infinity, the limit of the sequence, what happens to the sequence in the long run. Compare the limits below. Which limit exists? Why? All right, so our first one is the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x. And our second one is the limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x. Okay, so let's get a sense for what happens to the limit as x goes to infinity of sine x. Well, first let's take a quick graph of how does sine x behave. If we start here at x equals zero, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up, and it just continues in this method forever and ever and ever and ever, right? It never changes this thing of going up, down, up, down, up, down, right? That's how sine x works. It repeats itself over and over forever. So what that means is we've got it bouncing. We're bouncing between positive one at its maximum and negative one forever. We're always going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? We never stop bouncing up and down. So if that's the case, since we never stop bouncing up and down, it never settles down to a specific value, right? It's going to always be near the values of positive one and negative one and zero, but it never steadies out to a single thing, right? If we say it's going to be at zero in the long run, well, it's going to wind up getting away from zero over and over and over, so it's never settling down. So if it never settles down, that means that the limit does not exist. So the limit here does not exist. What about our other limit though? The limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x. Well, what happens? Once again, sine x, our top bounces between negative one and positive one forever. 
Okay. But the bottom grows forever, right? This x right here, it's going to get larger and larger and larger as x goes off to infinity. So as x goes off to infinity, the bottom will grow forever. So the top, it oscillates between plus 1, negative 1, plus 1, negative 1, plus 1, negative 1, but our bottom, it gets larger and larger and larger. 1, 10, 100, 1,000. So since the top, it never really manages to get very far, right? It isn't growing without bound, it's just bouncing between these two numbers. So even at its largest possible values of positive 1 and negative 1, if we divide that by, you know, x out at a billion, x out at a quadrillion, it's going to be crushing it down to these very small numbers. Thus, we have the the fraction will wind up being crushed, right? The bottom, in long run, in the long run, the bottom is going to crush the top. So in the long run, it winds up looking like zero. If you want to see what that winds up looking like, what we've sort of got is this divide by x. Well, 1 over x has a graph like this. Right? Is it approaches it. So our sine of x, it's going to be bouncing sort of between these two possible extremes. So it winds up getting squeezed down closer and closer and closer and closer to this zero value. And that's why it winds up happening. And that's why we wind up having this long-term value of zero. In sine x, it bounces up and down forever, right? It just keeps going up and down and up and down. But over here in sine x divided by x, this divide by x over the long run sort of pinches it down, keeps it crushed down. So it starts off with these large oscillations, but as it goes farther and farther out, it has to get smaller and smaller because the x, the divide by x, crushes it down, and so it gets crushed down to a very single value. It will continue to oscillate, but it's getting closer and closer and closer. It has to stay in this window near this value, this height value of zero, and so since it gets crushed down slowly over time to zero, it effectively just approaches zero in the long run. So we have a limit as x goes to infinity of zero. Fourth example, compare the limits below, which exists, y. So first, we could just graph this to get a sense of what's going on. If we graph this, limit as x goes to negative infinity of 2x and limit as x goes to positive infinity of 2x, well, if we graph, what does 2 to the x look like? Well, at 0, it's going to be at 1. And then as we go out, it's going to get very large very quickly. As we go to the left, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, that's how what it happens. It will never get past the x-axis, but it's going to wind up getting smaller and smaller and smaller. If we look at some values, we see that at x equals 1, x equals 2, x, uh, sorry, x equals negative 1, x equals negative 2, x equals negative 3. For this, we'd have 2 to the negative 1, and then 2 to the negative 2, and then 2 to the negative 3, which would come out to be 1 half, 1 over 2 squared, so 1 over 4, 1 over 3, sorry, 2 to the 3, which would be 1 over 8. So 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 8. It gets smaller and smaller. So it's always going to smaller values as x goes off to negative infinity. So since it's always going off to smaller and smaller values, that is values closer and closer to zero, right? As 2 becomes, 2 to the negative number becomes very large, as that negative number becomes very large, it's going to be 1 over 2 to the very large number, which is going to make a very tiny fraction. So over the long run, it winds up getting crushed down to zero. However, if we look at the limit as x goes to positive infinity of 2 to the x, if we look at just the first couple numbers, 2 to the 1, and then 2 squared, and then 2 to the 3, that is x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, we'd wind up getting 2, and then 4, and then 8. So it's getting bigger and bigger as it winds up going larger and larger, right? So as it gets closer and closer to positive infinity, it will get larger and larger and larger. So we wind up seeing that since it's going to get larger and larger and larger, it's never going to stabilize to a single value. It's never going to go to some specific value L. So that means the limit does not exist because it will just blow off forever and ever, going up forever and ever. Fifth example, evaluate the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x over x plus 1 minus x squared over 4 times x plus 1 squared. So the first thing to notice here is that this portion of the fraction, this fraction here, doesn't really have an effect on this fraction here during the process of the limit. So as x goes to infinity, this fraction and this fraction, they don't really interact with each other, right? They're basically separate. So if they're basically separate, we can split the limit into the two portions. So we can split it into the limit as x goes to infinity of the first portion, 2x over x plus 1, minus the limit as x goes to infinity of the second portion, x squared over 4 times x plus 1 squared. 
All right, now we can evaluate both of these on their own. So for the first one, 2x over x, right? They both have the same leading coefficient. If we imagine very large numbers going in there, we're comparing two times big number over big number plus one. The plus one doesn't really matter, so we only care about two times big over big. The bigs cancel each other out effectively, and we can think of this as just going, well, it will go to precisely two in the long run, right? As x goes off forever and ever, it's going to get closer and closer to two minus the limit as x goes to infinity. For this one, we're not quite sure because let's expand the x plus 1 squared, although we can see x squared divided by something that's also going to contain an x squared. So we should probably be able to see, oh, in the long run, that's going to wind up basically going to x2 positive, in, uh, sorry, x in the long run as x goes to positive infinity, we'll wind up seeing it go to 1 over 4, but let's expand it so we can see it clearly. Limit as x goes to infinity, so x squared doesn't change on top divided by 4 times x plus 1 squared, x plus 1 squared. That's just equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. So if we multiply 4 times that, right, 4 times the expansion of x plus 1 squared, we get 4x squared plus 8x plus 4. So we've still got 2 in front minus the limit as x goes to infinity of this. Well, actually, at this point, we don't even need to do another limit because we can see the top has the leading exponent of x squared. The bottom is the leading exponent of squared as well. So we just compare the coefficients in front, 1 and 4, right? Since we've got big number squared up top divided by 4 times big number squared plus 8 times big number. Well, that's not really going to be much compared to big squared plus just plain 4. That's going to not be much compared to big. So it's really 1 big squared over 4 big squared. So the big squareds effectively cancel out, leaving us with 1 over 4 in the long run. So we've got minus 1 over 4. So we've broken down each piece of the limit. We've figured out that the first portion becomes 2. The second portion becomes 1 quarter. So 2 minus 1 quarter. That simplifies to 7 over 4. Yay. All right. Final example, example 6. Evaluate the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence n minus 1 factorial divided by n plus 1 factorial. So the first thing we want to do here is we want to think, well, we don't really see how to do this immediately. So we want to see, can we simplify this into something where we've got less going on? Factorials, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's going on with factorials. So maybe let's get a sense for, is there some way to cancel them? Can we expand things? Well, we'd realize, oh, they're both based around somewhat the similar thing, right? n plus 1 isn't very far from n minus 1. So we can expand the factorials so that we can cancel out based on that. So we've got n minus 1 factorial on top, n plus 1 factorial, well, that's going to be n plus 1 times 1 less than that, which is going to be n times 1 less than that, n minus 1 times 1 less than that. Well, if we keep going down forever, that's going to be n minus 1 factorial here. So we've got n minus 1 factorial on the top and n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 factorial on the bottom. Well, we can cancel the n minus 1 factorials now. Now I've got the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n plus 1 times n. So now we can see as n goes off to infinity, well, our top, it doesn't change at all, right? It's just a constant in this case. So since our top isn't ever going to change, but our bottom, n plus 1 times n, that's going to get larger and larger and larger as n goes off to infinity. That means our bottom's growing, but our top's just staying the same. So in the long run, it's going to get crushed down to 0. The fraction will get crushed down to 0. So the limit of the sequence is 0. All right, so that finishes up for our exploration of limits in this course. We're now going to move on to derivatives, and we'll get a cool sense for how derivatives work. It's really great stuff. We're getting a chance to see a preview of calculus, which is going to be really useful for when you get to calculus, because we're setting a groundwork here that you'll then be able to draw upon later when you learn this stuff again. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.